So I have two. Yeah. So all speakers mute, and so that we can start. There will be no interruptions, inshallah. First of all, I like to say assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. This is Dr. Carlos, Dr. Ahmed, Dr. Saad, are you hearing me nicely or not? Now it's okay. Uh, now, now it's okay, though. Now, now it's okay, but before it was... Before there was, because maybe I, I'm a little bit far, but I can uh, increase my voice. It's okay now? No, it's not a matter of the voice. No, I think it was connection error. So if you can kindly repeat, Fahad, because I think nobody knew the introduction. Yeah, the beginning, exactly. Uh, okay, so now I will start from the beginning. Uh, Assalamu alaikum everyone and good evening. Uh, today we are having uh, an eminent international speakers uh, from uh, Spain, from UK, uh, from Saudi Arabia and from UAE. Uh, Dr. Carlos Matteo, Dr. Carlos Fabizio and Dr. Saad and Dr. Ahmed al -Bari. And I'm proud to be uh, in, in this uh, in international speaker. So you can hear me or not? Doc, your internet connection, I think it's slowly. Internet is connection, yes. Uh, with me? It's okay. Mm. Okay, so, uh, and I want to repeat uh, some uh, instruction. If I want of no instruction, just a request from our colleagues. If they have uh, any uh, uh, questions, they can send their questions. Uh, and anyone who wants to interact and to talk uh, and uh, uh, with us also, he can just raise the hand and send the question so we can uh, just open the mic for him and we can have a question. We can write inside it. Uh, uh, he can write inside this uh, 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 question the name of the speaker. Okay, if it is okay, it's what it is for us. Like, I have to see my sister, everyone is so many people that are here. If there is any woman, let us send us a dialogue, they are not hearing us. Also, like, if anyone uh, is not hearing uh, us, it will be a bother. Um, I will uh, be uh, starting my uh, presentation. I will be the first uh, speaker of this uh, presentation. Uh, uh, I will have actually to, to, 
talk about um, the real life practice uh, dealing with diabetic macular edema. Uh, DME is one, is, it's actually is the most common leading uh, so it's actually a burden and it is uh, more um, becoming more and more uh, uh, a, a case of, or we can say, uh, more affected on the DME now. And how many from the RCT facilities? We are having a revision actually by having the so this is just a, a review of or a retrospective study. I have two presentations, a small presentation about this one. Uh, the first one will start with uh, a, a review study. It's a retro, uh, called retro ideal study. Uh, this study is a multi-center study that formed in 16 German centers. Uh, there is um, uh, the inclusion criteria, which is the most important when we are talking about uh, uh, the illusion, that we are, they are in such a response to anti -DF. So, Hello? Hello, Dr. Al Amri. Yes, I think they have a problem with Dr. Al Amri voice, I believe. I think he's disconnected uh, accidentally. Oh, okay. Would it be possible to move to the second speaker until Dr. Muhammad gets connected and internet resolves, John? I think, I think that's a good idea. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yes, yes. Uh, I think Dr. Uh, Carlos, I think for you, okay? He's the one to be next. But I believe Dr. Mohammed, he, he should end the sharing, right? Or he needs to stop sharing. Yeah, but, but otherwise, uh, you I guys can hear our voices clearly. End. If John, if you can end the sharing from Dr. Mohammed. Yes, I'm trying now. Yeah, I've done that. I've done that. Okay. So, okay. But, but I mean, everybody else can hear the voice clearly otherwise, so it's his own, his own connection? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so uh, we, we're certainly going to fix this uh, minor glitch there, and we'll, we'll be able to go back to the first talk. So uh, I'll be presenting some data from the uh, Illuvian study, which was for non-infectious uh, posterior viitis. Uh, which is a 36 months data of this prospective randomized double mask international study, uh, which uh, was conducted uh, in two. Uh, Carlos, just... you can't see your screen yet. You cannot see the screen. Hello. I seem to be sharing. You can't see it. No. I want to get Dr. Mohammed. I can see it. I, I see disclosure now. I can see it. Yeah, disclosures. You can see that. Yeah, I can see it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. For, for me, not yet. I, we, I still no, seeing no. Doctor. For me, yeah, just, I'm still yeah. seeing Doctor Al Hamdi screen. I still see oh, Doctor Al Hamdi. Uh, can you see that now? Or not yet. I see it. I, I, at least I see it. Yeah. No, I think. <laughs> for no need just to start okay you can start. yes now it's okay yeah okay so back to that again apologies for this um the study was involving as i mentioned a non-infectious posterior viitis so the main inclusion criteria would be patients who had a history of non-infectious viitis for at least one year and also had have proof that uveitis was active. So two separate recurrences of uveitis requiring systemic therapy or local therapy 
or in the previous 12 months received treatment to indicate also that they had activity. These patients had to be adults and when they were enrolled into the study, the eye had to be quiet. So the study was designed not to rescue an eye that was inflamed, but to treat an eye that had been quieted down prior to initiation of the study. Uh, the pressure was an important point. Pressure is controlled without medication and uh, no recent treatment with other devices that might interfere with the, uh, the intervention. The important exclusion criteria was any form of infectious uveitis or if the uveitis was only anterior. If the patient had vitreous hemorrhage or evidence of glaucoma or uncontrolled ocular pressure, uh, then they would uh, also be uh, rejected for the study. Also, hypotony was a exclusion criteria. The main outcome measure of the study was the control of this. So what the proportion of patients who showed recurrence of uveitis by six months, the secondary points would be the recurrence rates at other time points, the time to first recurrence, number of recurrences, vision, macular edema, and number of adjunctive treatments that we're using, how did they behave once the implant was given. And of course, the safety endpoints, which include especially cataract and intraocular pressure, but also uh, inflammatory signs and reduction of vision. This is how the study was designed. So once the patients were identified and screened, they were randomized two to one to receive the implant or a sham injection. And once that happened, they would taper their systemic treatment within a period of three months. They were followed up and the first primary endpoint would be at six months, as mentioned before, when you have efficacy and safety analysis, the study continued up to 36 months when we have two other endpoints when the same analysis was carried out. Important to mention here that during the study, any patient from either group who had a recurrence of uveitis could be rescued by standard of care and then continue into the study. So we would analyze not only the time to the first recurrence, but a number of events that might have happened in the course of those 36 months. So the recurrences were defined as an increase in inflammation at the anterior segment or vitreous haze increasing by two steps or a deterioration of vision of at least 15 letters of best corrected visual acuity. Everything was measured after the seventh day because we have to take into account this was a surgical intervention in a way and would it itself induce some inflammation in the eye. So the first days were discarded. This is the, uh, this, the, the, the patients included in the study we had uh, 87 patients who started on the implant arm and 42 in the uh, sham arm. And most patients completed the study. And uh, down here in the stable, you can see the reasons why uh, the patients were discontinued. And you can see that there were no adverse events in either group and lack of efficacy was only in the sham group as expected. But there are other reasons which were unrelated to the study uh, intervention. This is just to give you the baseline characteristics of the patients in both groups. And it, there's nothing here which is significantly from the point of view of the statistics, but it showed there was some uh, features like duration of disease a bit longer in the patient receiving the implant, but a bit more of vitreous haze, a bit more of AC reaction or absence of AC reaction in the group receiving the implant, but nothing that reached statistical significance. This is the result of the six months, which shows that uh, at that time, no recurrence in 72.4% of the patients on the implant arm and only 9.5% with treated control. So within six months of having discontinued their regular treatment, having received the sham injection, 90.5% of the patients had already recurred. So that's the very, this is the primary endpoint of the study. If we look at 36 months, then uh, still about 35% of the patients remained protected without any recurrences. I'll discuss, show you some information about what happened to the other patients who recurred. But just to show you here that there's a significant protection from the point of view of developing an event. This is what happened with the Kaplan-Meier survival curve, which indicates that the patients who were treated with the implant had a median time to first recurrence of 657 days against 70.5 days of the patients who were treated with the sham. Also the number of uh, events they experienced during the time of the study, only 1.7 events for the arm receiving the implant against 5.3 for the sham arm. In terms of this graph, just to show you visually what happened, the blue, the light blue below indicates the patients who survived without any recurrence. And you can see very clearly that on the left, the, the implant shows that the uh, patients 
had a much more significant, much more significant protection in terms of recoveries comparing to the individuals who received the sham, who dropped virtually to only one patient just uh, over six months all the way to the end of the study. This is the cumulative recurrences. So what you see here that uh, most of the patients didn't ex experience on the implanted arm any recurrences, like 34% uh, had no recurrence throughout the study, but only in terms of what happened to the other patients, most of the ones who had a recurrence had just one recurrence predominantly. If you look at the treated arm, you had, uh, as mentioned before, a, a high rate of recurrence very early on in the study. But if you keep looking at what happened over time, up to 40% of the patients ended up having more than five recurrences during the study. In terms of visual acuity, keeping in mind that rescue was offered if patients were experiencing a event. So it means that we're trying to protect the patients from damage. You can see that there was a, a no change and no gain was very similar in the two groups, but clearly still a, a better protection from the point of view of the implanted arm. But when you look at the losses and gains, most of the patients who lost more than 15 letters were patients who were on the sham arm and the patients who gained more than 15 were on the uh, uh, implanted arm. In terms of the behavior of vision over time, uh, you can see that uh, the group receiving the implant had a significant improvement very early on and maintained that throughout with a, a little dip in the curve indicating mostly cataract. Uh, that is uh, the reason why the vision drops and then increases again once these operations are carried out for to, to deal with the problem. In terms of the macro thickness, you can see here that there is a very sharp improvement in the thickness of the macula on the, in the implanted arm right at the beginning, which is maintained throughout the 36 months, which is the blue line down below the blue dot. If you look at the line above, you can see that there was some degree of protection, keeping in mind again, that these patients were receiving injections as a way of protecting them from the, the events that were happening. This is in terms of adjunctive treatment. Well, the, the two groups received, of course, in the course of this, the, the study uh, rescue. We know exactly what the frequencies were in terms of number of times they needed that. But you can see here that uh, predominantly the patients on the uh, implanted arm, 65% uh, year had no treatment received. But then in terms of systemic, the, the numbers go to 34% of the patients were requiring some form of immunosuppression. Against the sham arm, that 50% of them required an intervention with systemic treatment. When we look at the intervention with local therapy, that big, brings a big difference. We can see that the sham arm receives significantly more local therapy, which is an important event in terms of explaining some of the findings of the safety aspects, which we'll discuss with you in a minute. Here we go to the safety, and we can see that our major concern with any steroid injection in the eye is pressure. And we look at this study, we can see there isn't really a significant impact of pressure when comparing the two groups. And interestingly, there is a more obvious number of operations in the control arm. And that is down to what I said before, because they were receiving local intervention with other types of steroids, that was increasing the, the problem they were having with more significant pressure problems and eventually needing surgery. So in terms of the pressure, no real concerns you know, shown by this study. In terms of cataract, yes, as expected, the arm receiving the implant had a much more significant number of interventions. So conclusions of this study is that the patients who received the implant had significantly more non-recurrence or disease-free comparing to the sham arm. The time to recurrence was significantly different, much longer time for the first event to occur. The number of reduction, the, the recurrences were also reduced in the arm the, receiving the implant. And the treatment of recurrences were, uh, in, in terms of local uh, therapy, much more given to the sham arm, which explains some of the problems they had later on. Safety is what I mentioned just now, that IOP is well controlled in both arms, so not a, a real problem. And cataract, of course, a, a significant issue related to the implanted eye. I think this will uh, bring me to a, a second presentation, which uh, will uh, deal with the, let me just bring this over to you now, with the cases I was asked to show you with real world experience. Because the, the problem we have with trials is that they are looking at uh, a, a group of patients under the label of non-infectious posterior uveitis. And here we, we don't know exactly for individual diseases what happens. So I'm gonna give you a very quick flavor of some patients that I've seen and one case from a colleague who kindly allowed me to use it because it's a very illustrative case. 
So I'll show you here this first case. It's a lady who presented to us, a, a lady in 58 years old, with floaters as her main complaint, uh, with very good visual acuity, but disturbed by the floaters. So the examination was in keeping with the retinal vasculitis affecting both of her eyes. We attempted to treat her systemically. She wasn't responding well or tolerating well her treatment. And then we went on for the option of local therapy with illusion. So this is how she presented. You can see the vitreous involvement is the reason why she was unhappy. We can see in the angiogram, she had very marked diffuse retinal vascular leakage in both eyes and the presence of diffuse edema also in both eyes. This is a picture taken back a few, a few months later on. Uh, during this time, she was you know, trying to treat her with systemic therapy, but there are many reasons why she wasn't coping or uh, the treatment wasn't working. So we can still see the same level of activity. At this stage, we decided to try Illuvian. So she had the two eyes implanted, very short between the two. And you can see here an image at the top, the image you've just seen from January, which shows the still the leakage in the eyes. The image below is from a few months later, in August of the same year. And you can see already an impact of the Illuvian in the level of leakage that was happening in both of her eyes. This is an image taken in March 2017, so about a year after the implants were given, and you can see that there is a marked control of the inflammation and an improvement in the status of the macula with some thickening related to an epiretinal membrane. We go here for images taken now April 18, so we are two years into this implant now, and she's much happier with the fact that she doesn't have much vitritis. The level of leakage in the retina is better controlled. The areas of hyperfluorescence you see there uh, are areas in which there's more RPE abnormality rather than retinal vascular leakage. And we can see here, this is September last year, which means this is over the three year duration of the implant. And this is the image we have. So this is an, a case in which implant in both eyes led to good control over inflammation over a period of time above the three years for which the implant is designed to work. The second case is a case of birdshot which has a retinal vascular component, very similar in many ways to intermediate uveitis or retinal vasculitis, but it has also a choroidal inflammatory component. And this is the problem in this disease that I want to show you here. So this patient uh, came also with a lot of problems related to her systemic therapy, not actually tolerating the treatment very well or having side effects that had to force the discontinuation of therapy. So effectively she was not well inflamed. When you look at this eye and you can see the vitreous is a very good view the uh, autofluorescence doesn't show any significant changes at this stage and, and pay attention to the autofluorescence because I'll show you later what happens to her. And we can see here in her angiogram that she has very minor focal areas of leakage and the shadows you see there are from the vitreous opacity. She had a good macular thickness, not actually having macular edema, but her choroid was obviously inflamed with the presence of the typical birdshot lesions obviously seen on the ICG on the right. For both eyes is a very similar picture. So she was at this stage because she was intolerant to everything else and she was very worried and we were worried about her choroid as well. We decided to give her illusion to both of her eyes. So what happened, we can see that uh, she doesn't really show much in terms of retinal vascular leakage, it's improvement from that point of view. Uh, and what we see is the choroid looks unchanged. So she still had choroidal lesions in both of her eyes. We can see what was worrying to us is that apart from having the choroidal lesions seen on ICG, her EDI OCTs were showing the choroid was markedly thickened. So we were concerned that the Luvian, even though controlling the retinal vascular leakage very well, was unable to achieve control of the choroidal lesions. So effectively here we can see how well the retina looks on top of a choroid that is markedly thickened. So at this stage there was a decision that uh, we had to do something else for her because the picture didn't seem well controlled. And if you look at these images here, pay attention to the peripapillary area on the autofluorescence. You can see that comparing to the initial images I showed you, something is happening involving the RPE in that area. So indicating that that choroidal inflammation is having an impact on the outer retina. So this is very obvious here on this image when you see that the retinal vessels are not leaking, but the RPE shows obvious uh, abnormality. That happened in both of her eyes. So she was giving out a limumab, and that limumab led to a progressive rescue of the inflammation of the choroid and the situation improved. As you can see here, the images showing how she behaved under adalimumab with resolution of the dark spots in the choroid uh, in both of her eyes. So the message here is choroidal inflammation has to be well controlled or it will eventually damage the retina from the, the, the back. So it's not only controlling the retinal vascular leakage, but controlling the choroidal inflammation is important. And unfortunately, it doesn't seem that the illusion can help us with that. But 
the use of Illuvian in combination with systemic therapy would allow you to use less systemic treatment, which the combined treatment leads to less side effects and better control of the inflammation in both compartments. Very quickly here, I'll show the final case, which is very illustrative from Mr. Thomas Burke, a colleague from Bristol, with a patient who had anterior uveitis and macular edema, secondary to poor control of an HLA B27 scenario, leading to a chronic presentation. And this patient also had problems with systemic therapy, ended up receiving many intraocular injections to both of her eyes and had to be commenced on analimumab. When she was treated with analimumab, the situation was improving, but unfortunately, she developed a side effect and the treatment had to be stopped. So after that, she developed inflammation in both eyes. You can see here more cells in the right eye and eventually developed a lot of inflammation uh, in, uh, in requiring the use of uh, Ozodex in the right eye. The right eye responded very well, but you can see that the left eye now is inflamed with macular edema and Ozodex was planned for the left eye. Left eye was injected, got better, but four months after the Ozodex in the right eye, the situation deteriorated again. So she was forced into being treated again for the right eye and the left eye lost control. So in summary, you can see this very illustrative image indicating how many times she lost control within a few months of each injection of Ozodex requiring further injection. At this stage, we was feeling that uh, Illuvian would be a good alternative, still off-label at that time in 2014, and she received injection to both of her eyes with good control of the inflammation bilaterally. The graph illustrates very well that that bizarre behavior up and down with Yosrodex was corrected by the Illuvian leading to a very stable situation. The problem is that after two years of the Illuvian, she was still under control, but the situation deteriorated after the third year when she had a very severe flare-up of inflammation in her left eye. Decided to implant again, but this time the implant didn't work. And the conclusion was probably they dropped the implant on the floor before they injected in the eye, which can happen if you point your device downwards when you were holding it in your hand. They couldn't find it in the eye, not even with a B scan. So they decided to proceed with another injection of uh, the Illuvian, which would be effectively the second, not the third. And what happened after that is that we again achieved good control. So this illustrates very well the ability of this implant over a period of time of three years to allow patients to reach control and avoid these ups and downs of inflammation, which are not uncommon in this scenario. So I hope this concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Pavizio. Uh, I hope that you are hearing me now. Yes, yes, yes. that's good. Uh, thank you. Sorry for the problem that happens. I think because I am in the hospital and um, the internet is not uh, stable. So I'm sorry for that again. Uh, if there is any question from dear colleagues here uh, uh, to Dr. Pavizio, Dr. Ahmed, Dr. Saad, Dr. Carlos, anyone want to ask Dr. Pavizio uh, about his presentation? No questions? Uh, can you hear me, Dr. Pavizio? Yes, I can. Okay, uh, uh, Dr. Babizio, uh, you are having a, a good experience, as I know, uh, in treating a patient uh, with you. Uh, how long now you are using uh, Illuvian in treatment of uveitis? Well, we we have been I've been using Illuvian even before it was licensed off label use uh, for my patients because I felt it was a, a good alternative. As you can see, the cases I presented were patients who were intolerant to systemic therapy uh, or were having trouble with the doses necessary to control the disease. So we've been using it uh, for several years now. I have patients who are on the second implant uh, and they went towards the end of that second cycle. So we have been using for about six years that I've been implanting these this eyes. Um, the experience has been uh, mostly positive with patients with retinal vascular leakage, so intermediate uveitis, macular edema, these patients respond very well. Clearly what I showed you here, which is a good important message for everyone listening, that choroidal pathology does not seem to be treated by this intervention. And uh, it's important to remember that because if you allow the choroidal disease not to be treated, as you know, in many choroidal diseases, you end up damaging the retina. So important is if you have a patient needing a lot of medication because it can control the, the vascular leakage very well, using an illusion implant may help you control that and reduce the burden of systemic therapy, which for choroidal disease may be on a lower level necessary for that. Uh, in case of the uveitis, how do you 
uh, uh, decide, I mean, or, or select the patient, uh, and what is the time you think it will be similar when you are treating DME? Uh, it is about now. We're not talking only about DME itself or the macular edema, but we are talking about pruritus now. And so there is another uh, uh, things that we are dealing with. So when we are talking about DME, we are saying three years. Uh, how do you feel in according to the severity? How do you manage to decide what you are going to do with this uh, case? Okay. I think the first message is important, is you're not using Illuvian to rescue an active uveitis. So if you have a patient who is very active, uh, it may be very hard to say that the drug is not licensed for that. So you don't, you can have trouble saying that you can control a very active uveitis. But the point of the study and, and what we try to do is bring it under control with other methods. And once you have control, you introduce the Illuvian to be able to prolong the control over the duration of the effect of the implant. So we may try systemic therapy. You may try even using a Nosrodex first, and then in continuity to that, applying the uh, Illuvian as a way of maintaining that control. It's very variable what you see at the moment. We don't have enough long, no, long time data to, to say the duration of the implant efficacy. People are reporting that some implants fail after two years. I've just shown you a case that the implant is still active after three years. So it's possible that we have a range of uh, effects that will uh, vary in time. Uh, we know with those are decks that for us in three months, most of cases, three to four months are failing. So it's not going to the six months, which was originally the idea. So I use Illuvian when I want to reach long-term control, but I may not use it as a rescue therapy. I use it as a maintaining control rather than rescue. Uh, there is another thing to comment about this one, Dr. Uh, 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 Babizio. Um, I mean, now when you will decide that you are using another method of treatments like uh, dexamethasone, so or something that you depend to shift to uh, Illuvian yeah. or to keep the Illuvian as a maintenance. Yeah, well, in terms of all the local, all the local therapies, you just mentioned the dexamethasone. So the dexamethasone is likely to work in many patients. And if you use it and it works, that would be for you a proof that local therapy is a good alternative. So rather than repeating several Ozodex over time, you may very well decide that after one or two injections, you know the behavior in that patient and you know that you'd like to use something that will prolong the effect. So I would say, yes, try one first, see how they behave, and then you can replace that approach with Illuvian. Systemic therapy still is very commonly used in uveitis. Depending on the nature of the disease, it still is the best alternative. So we don't say that Illuvian come in, comes in to replace everything else. Illuvian is a very interesting option which can be selected for a few patients uh, who will have a disease for which you want to uh, control you know, reducing the burden of exposure to systemic drugs and patients who have shown that local therapy is effective. So I think it is uh, probably exploring your options and if patients are suffering side effects, not tolerating the level of treatment you're given, uh, if you try a Nosodex and if they respond to that, you can then consider Illusion as a very good long-term alternative for you. Okay, so because uh, we have many questions, I have now many questions coming from the, our yeah. attendees, but I want a very short as possible the answer. Yes, yeah, sure. What was the testament after the Illuvian for case number two? What was, sorry, the assessment? The test, yeah, testament. Uh, I think it is meaning treatment after Illuvian for case number two. Oh, no, the, the patient who received the patient I showed you here, that was the birdshot patient, that lady was intolerant to any treatment. She was only receiving the uh, Illuvian until we decided that because of the choroid thickening, she had to receive Adalimumab. So for the most of the time of I showed, the images I showed you were based only on Illuvian. She was not able to take anything else. The moment we were unhappy that the choroid was not controlled, she had Adalimumab. Okay, uh, there is another question. Did you notice any difference in response in uh, various non-infectious uh, uveitis disease? Difference in the response? Yeah, well, the different type of non-infectious. Yeah, the, the, the trial did not allow us to analyze the subtypes of uveitis because the numbers are small for each category. So we don't have a specific situation when I say to you that Illuvian will be better for one or another disease. 
What we know now from experience is one point is this, not good for choroidal disease, but very good for diseases inflaming the retina, uh, the, the vessels and macular edema. So that is a very broad division, but I can tell you about specific disease. I would not treat VKH, sympathetic ophthalmia with an illusion. Uh, I wouldn't treat Bechet with an illusion because they need systemic treatment. So there okay. are a few things that are still the same as before. Oh, we have another also question. Did you try other decks before using Iruvian? And at the same time, did you also try to use uh, other decks as a test uh, or challenging test before well, starting? We, we, we have. You see the, the, the patient here. I've showed you two cases in which patient, one case at least, the patient had other decks responding very well, but lasting for a short time. So the decision to change is because of that up and down we had. So we do try other decks first. That's very much what we try if they're very active because they want to bring it under control. What you find is because illusion works better if the eye is already quiet, you can give an Ozordex, wait for that to quiet down. And when you know the illusions, the Ozordex is about to fail, which could be three to four months, you can then inject your illusion, which will then allow you to maintain the control long term. So, yes, I think trying that is, a, is an option. It's hard way to do. Uh, we have only one minute before then we can shift to another uh, speakers. We are, uh, in some cases, after illusion injection, I'm not able to see the implant sure. even in the periphery. What may be the reason? I think you have yeah. to talk about this one and you repeat it, right? Yeah, we, okay. we all see that. The first time you do it, you panic because you think you didn't inject in the eye. As it happened in the case of I described to you, they actually did not inject. But yes, it can go in the periphery, very peripheral. You, using indentation, you can probably see it, but in a few patients, I have one case that only ultrasound demonstrated that it was in the eye. So it is probably because it doesn't go into the vitreous, it may slide just above the hyaloid and remains very peripheral and anterior. So it's very hard to see, but it's working. So it doesn't matter that is in that location, it's gonna work. Okay, so the last, also the last question, but very short answer. Is it, yes. is it possible that other that would be effective and not Illuvian in the same case? No, we, we have patients in which we have injected Ozodex for choroidal disease. For instance, it didn't work as well. So Ozodex does not treat choroidal disease. And, and patients in which Ozodex fails increases significantly the risk that your Illuvian will not work. I think there is a good chance that if your Ozodex has no impact, that Illuvian probably won't have an impact either. Thank you very much, Dr. Babizio, for this. Uh, uh, I have just a comment about... Uh... If it is possible about the uh, yes, the question, question. I asked uh, the question. If there is any question, but nobody. No, no. Me. This is no, no. Comment about the question that uh, has been asked by one of the attendees about. Uh, sometimes you inject a uh, lumen and you cannot see it in the periphery. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, you know, in the term of injection, if you look at the injection technique of the lumen compared to versus Ozordex, Ozordex, you have the two-step technique, so you might miss it or somehow, but with illusion, if you properly load it, you make sure that it's properly loaded and to stick to the rules of the two-click uh, technique, because you go straight direct, there is no two-step with the, because of 25 gauge, so you go straight ahead inside the midvitreous cavity or inside the vitreous cavity. With, the, with this lens, you are 100% sure that the implant, it must be inside the eye. So... There is no risk to be out, except if you uh, improperly load the 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 the, uh, the injector. So if you properly load it, load it properly, and you make sure that uh, the the uh, blanch push it inside the also you are sure because you are going straight ahead. So unless if it is not in the lens, <laughs> so it's inside the, the vitreous. So yeah. okay, don't thank you, thank you, Ahmed, for this uh, comment. Uh, can we now? Okay, Ahmed, also it is your uh, now time. For your presentation. I think, I think your presentation because we swap between you. No and problem. I will do it later on. I will do the last. This is, uh, I, I will see inshallah the internet. I don't want to have the same problem and we lose the time. Okay. So okay. Go, go, go ahead, please, Dr. Ahmed. Thank you. Uh, can you see my presentation now? Yes, yes. Dr. Ahmed so, is a uh, regional surgeon, consultant in SKMC. Dear friend Ahmed, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Muhammad, and I want to thank you all the my colleagues. It's a good, uh, uh, it's a pleasure to be here today, and also thank Alimera for uh, hosting this meeting. So, uh, just to be quick, uh, I'm going to share with you uh, my experience or our experience with Eluvin and the DME and uh, UE. Uh, we have uh, recently published the uh, six-month data for the uh, uh, rapid structural and functional improvement. For sure, it was published uh, in January. Uh, so it's available online. It's free. You have, can access to it or can send it to anyone you want to have a look. Uh, 
for sure it's six months, it's, uh, it's short duration, but in this uh, uh, manuscripts, we uh, focus on the rabbit structure and functional improvement because it was uh, uh, interesting and surprising for me that the, uh, in, so, in most of the cases, the action uh, or the, the, the onset of action was so fast and I will go show later. So now we are submitting uh, the one year data, it's still under review and also uh, this two years data now we have, which I'm going to share with you today. So uh, in our trial or our study, we have uh, 20 patients, uh, DME patients, Sudafikic, all was Sudafikic, we exclude Fikic patients and we treated with uh, Iluvin and the patient was monitored as most of the study for the uh, one month, three months and until 24 months. Uh, for sure, the parameter was used as discretive visual equity, central micro thickness, and intraocular pressure for sure. Uh, here, this is the uh, baseline characteristics and demography of the patient. So what I want to highlight here is the duration of DME was a little bit uh, uh, fresh one. It's not like in FEM trial. And if you look at the result, actually, the visual outcome was significantly improved. We have uh, most of the patient gained more than almost 50 liters. And uh, this is for the one year data. And then for the two years, it was maintained over the uh, second year. Uh, we have uh, five patients who require top up therapy uh, to maintain the initial gain. And some patient gain also additional line in the, year, uh, the second year. For the anatomical outcome, uh, it was reflecting or mirroring the uh, gain in the visual equity. You can see here it was maintained uh, to all the uh, second year. Again, this is just combined both together, the visual equity with intermacular thickness. It was, uh, uh, for me, it was a good result. IOP, uh, we have uh, <clears throat> rise, IOP rise uh, in three patients. And if you calculate it in percentage, it's matching with the common percentage of the IOP rise in other uh, trial with Illusion. Uh, we have one patient that had uh, need glaucoma surgery, we, which was done by our glaucoma consultant with the implant Ahmed Valve. And uh, we can hear what I want to show you that the onset in most of the patient was starting two to four weeks after admission. And maybe someone asked, do you uh, bring the patient after two weeks only to see the, the, the result? The answer is yes. In special cases, when you have a new drug new in your hand, you really are eager to know how it's going on. So uh, we brought it after two weeks and then after uh, four weeks and also check the IOP. And surprisingly, the, 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 there was a, a great uh, improvement uh, uh, at week four. Uh, and this maintain or this gain was maintained uh, over the, uh, the 24 month. 90% of the patient actually maintained this drying effect. And so for the sake of time, I want to show you some cases, uh, some of the study and one case outside the study. And uh, the reason I'm sharing this case is because it's reflect really what's happening in the real clinical practice, because uh, in real clinical practice, it's sometimes different, it's most of the time different than the uh, uh, clinical trial. So the case one, it will resent a non-compliant patient. So let's see, have a look. This is a 45, uh, sorry, 54 patient, female patient, poorly controlled diabetes. That's a common rule here in our area. Uh, visual ecto 2100. You can see here, uh, cystoid macular edema. So, we start for here as a first line anti VGF. After two monthly injection, the patient, uh, the, the macula was dry and the vision improved. But uh, we asked the patient, we continue injecting for at least five or four injection, but the patient didn't show because he improved the vision. And also this patient was a little bit panic from the needle and the injection, despite all the psychological assurance happened. But anyway, he didn't show up. So he came back four months later for recurrent edema with worse visual equity. So. We explained to him again, we need to stick the treatment. You are a good responder. We need to keep injecting and we have to uh, come to you on your appointment for injection to be compliant for your, uh, because recurrent edema, it's have a, a, a negative impact on the final outcome in the long term. So another anti-VGF injection and one month, you see here how beautifully the macula dry. So we, again, we discussed, we have to continue the indication, we injection. And, but unfortunately, again, he disappeared. And again, the edema came again. And if you look, every time the edema recurred, the visual equity was worse than the other recurrence. Another anti-VGF one month again, and it proved. So this patient is a very good responder to anti-VGF. Despite this being non-compliant, 
to win a, a, this a show after three months, you can see here how the edema is uh, 2400 and the huge edema. So for sure, I discussed with him that with her, sorry, we need to change to a long acting uh, drug. So since you are not coming, you want to come to regular. So we switch here to intravitreal dexamethasone implant and two month post injection, beautiful result. Visual act improved, but we start to have some macular buckering there. Four months later, edema recur again. So definitely this was a good, I discussed with the patient that since we have no issue with the IOP, so I switch her to uh, 11 and uh, two weeks, uh, I want to show you two weeks post injection. You can see here improvement is a good improvement, like 50% improvement and four months, you can see here 12 months and 24 months now, this two years one study, you can see here visual is improved. Uh, not to the maximum, for sure, because this patient has some issue about the photoreceptor and the uh, ellipsoid zone and some macular buckering. But the vision, the vision was and it was stable, and the, the macula was dry for 24 months. Second case, um, this is what's more easy to decide because she's uh, already uh, poor control diabetes. Also, she's so coming for me second opinion. She has multiple intravitreal injection in the last year and also intravitreal dexamethasone implant twice. And the last one was done six months, six months before. So when she came to me, this is what the presentation, visual like 2400, IOP was normal after two injection of dexamethasone implant. So my decision was to go direct for uh, uh, Leuven in this case. And you look here, three weeks, three months. And I wanna have you, your attention here. If you look here to the uh, hyperreflective dots, which I, I really consider it in my treatment. Uh, this could be a sign, and we have many publications that could be a sign of inflammation. Anyway, so six months, you can hear it's getting dry, but also the thin is, uh, the retina is very thin. I can see atrophic changes from the laser, but the macula is dry, 12 month post injection, 2080. It's a very good visual active, some cyst here, but the central is uh, dry. And 27 months, this is the longest follow up I have till now. Uh, 28. And by the way, I mentioned in the, in the study that one of the patient has glaucoma surgery, and this is what the patient, this patient, despite the fact she received two uh, injection of the dexamethasone implant, she didn't develop any glaucoma or high IOP, but she developed with Illuvian uh, IOP rise was not controlled, and we try, we have to do surgery for her. And now the pressure is controlled and the macula is dry. And this give you know this give you an idea when I discussed this with the uh, our glaucoma consultant about uh, the steroid challenge generally speaking, uh, you know steroid is a is a is a big family, but has a lot of member so does not all behave the same so it's not hundred percent guaranteed there for sure the challenge test is a very important but it's not hundred percent sure that if you switch to another uh, steroid uh, molecule that you are 100% safe that uh, no rise of the pressure. So this was interesting for me. Case three, uh, this is also one of the uh, real case data that show us um, the, the, the uh, strategy or the concept of individualized treatment. If you look at this patient, he's 69 years old, uh, diabetic, non-controlled, a lot of comorbidity, history of a stroke one month ago, one month ago only at that time, came to me hemiplegic in a wheelchair from ambulance from outside the city, three hours drive with his son, complete decree vision in both eyes. On examination, visual quality was 2400 in both eyes, pressure was okay, then scattered in both eyes. OCT was done, you can see his macular edema in the right eye, and this is in the left eye more severe. And if you look, there's some videos that I want you to show you the whole scan of the macula. You can see here a lot of hyperreflective dots also and the heart exited. So what's the plan for this patient? So when I think about this patient with his specific situation, the plan, you can go for anti-VGF or steroids. So for anti-VGF, I was a little bit uh, reluctant to do that because as just one month ago, has a stroke and patient comorbidity, he's hemiplegic, he's coming from far, he cannot come for monthly visits. So the decision was to go direct for intravitreal dexamethasone implant. I discussed with the patient for sure the risk of IOP because he's already has cataract. So the only thing that we might have rise IOP, so we have to continue or to follow up the IOP at home city just to check for any rise of pressure. So injection was done and asked the patient to come after three months, but he didn't show up because of this case. He came six months later. So we can see here the edema is recurred again, uh, 2400, and also have a look on the hyperreflective dots here. 
the same, and you can see the quality is poor because of the uh, cataracts. So at that time, we decided to go, and the pressure was not high, so it gave me the chance to uh, plan him for a combined FECO with intravitreal phenylosinitisonide implant for his specific or special case. And one month later, you can see more the, the image was more clear because we removed the cataract, the edema improved, and again, a lot of hyperreflective dots here. You can see very obvious in the left eye, and this is uh, uh, the pressure does not getting high for, for thank God, everything was fine. Nine months later, you can see here again, the vision is improved, getting more improvement, getting more dry, still have problem with the uh, photoreceptor layers and uh, ellipsoid zone, pressure is okay. Case four, it's very interesting. It's not uh, a case including the study because she, is, she was a fake patient. She was a female, 50 years old, 55 this years the old. The last case, Ahmad? Yeah, 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 yeah. last case. Yes. Uh, uncontrolled, decreased vision in the right eye uh, two months ago. If you look at the examination, visual acuity was in the right eye 2050, pressure is okay, clear lens, OCT showed this cyst. <coughs> Sorry. So we start for, for, for anti-VGF. So uh, I start with ranibizumab, and uh, after three consecutive monthly injection, there is no change at all in terms of visual equity and uh, OCT. You can see it's like copy paste, no change, zero change or zero improvement. So um, for me, I'm following the uh, postdoc canal protocol I that after three injection, I decide to change or to switch. But in this case, <clears throat> I was at that time switched to aflibercept. And after three consecutive monthly injections, so it means six monthly injection of different uh, uh, anti-VGF, exactly the same visual equity, the same picture you can see here. So what's the plan now? I discuss, uh, uh, sorry for this kind of patient, if you inject uh, six in monthly injection and no improvement at all, usually I do the FFA for those patients to check if there is any other uh, pathology hidden. So this is the, the, the early phase video of the uh, FFA of this patient. You can see here uh, some leaking mechanism. There is nothing abnormal at all. Uh, you can see here, this is the, uh, the first uh, two minutes or one, one minute of the dry. So it's only just a leaking mechanism. And if you look at the picture, you can see it's a typical case of focal leaking mechanism, but inside the, 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 the very close to the fovea. So there is nothing abnormal there. It's just macular diabetic macular edema. So what's the plan now? I discussed with her to go for Dexamethone implant, I counsel with the patient for the risk of IOP and the cataract, but for sure the patient does not want injection because if I wear in her shoes, I would do the same because after six months of injection, no improvement, what make me uh, do another treatment and try another one? So I, I tell her, okay, let's follow up. She came back after three months and you can see here the visual act decreased and the edema increased and the visual act dropped. So at that time, we decided to go for intravitreal dexamethone implant risk counseling the patient for the risk of cataract and IP rise, agreed, I give intravitreal injection. And interestingly, one month post injection, you can see here, three months, no change at all. And even six months, it's getting worse, but the pressure does not increase. So the question here, what to do? Uh, again, I discussed with her that the only, that we are, the only medication now we have in our hand is the fluorocinacin. Can we try it? But there is 100% or 80% risk of cataract and IP rise. I again counsel it for IP rise despite the fact that the IP rise after elixir implant because I learned from the first case I show you before that it's not 100% uh, guarantee that if you use the challenges that is the pressure will not rise. So I, go, I offer her all things, good, but the patient uh, agreed for the treatment. So I let's say, uh, go, let's try uh, the fluorocinacin and the, interestingly after one month, the uh, macula was dry a little bit. Three months was stable with some changes here, visual equity is improving, and the IOP is a little, the is not increasing. But nine months later, you can see here, starting the edema care again a little bit here, vision a little bit dropped, but the cataract for sure uh, uh, increase. So, and the question now to the panelists, uh, what to do next? So, uh, just to take home message from my talk, what I want to highlight that we are not curing the disease, we are just treating the DME, which is a complication of the main ghost sitting there, which is diabetes. That's a challenge. And another thing, there is something still missing in the pathogenesis because if it is only VGF mediated or inflammation, I think most of the patient will respond for any either of this medication. But if you see the last patient, 
I've, I've, sh I've shared with you does not respond to any of these. So I think, and I, I believe that you are not aware about the, the new bi the new drugs now in the pipelines. They are uh, targeting now the endothelial cells, not only the extra uh, cellular vascular vas uh, VGF pathway. They are now more targeting the endothelial cells. And one more thing, the last thing is one size does not fit all. There is no single medication that can treat all type of diabetic uh, DME. We have different response pattern uncontrolled, a lot of comorbidity. So we still have some unmet need and some challenges, but we have, the, the, for my, my opinion, the best way to treat a patient is to <clears throat> individualize the treatment, to treat the patient just sitting in front of you in the sit lamp. And thank you. I hope thank that's a stick to my time. No, you are exceed anyway, no problem, but uh, we'll have the question at the end because we are running behind the time because of my problem also in the beginning. So now I will go to directly to a doctor. If there is any question uh, to Dr. Ahmed al Baki, or we want to keep to the end to be more better, so I can go now directly to uh, my dear friend, uh, Dr. Carlos uh, Matthew. He's a consultant ophthalmologist, vitreoretinal uh, surgeon, associated professor of the master in retina and vitreous uh, at IMO, Faculty of Medicine of the Autonomous University of Barcelona. Uh, we are proud to be, and we are glad to have you, Dr. Uh, Carlos with us. Can you just mute yourself, unmute yourself and start? Okay, hey, Mohammed, I think you can see now my presentation. Yeah. And thank you very much for your kind invitation. Let, let's, let me change the topic. You know, I, I, I do mostly uh, vitro retinal surgery, mostly a medical retina then. I'm going to show you uh, three three topics, three small, case, three small cases, you know, very short cases. Uh, two about myopia and one about Illuvian. Uh, in the cases we use Illuvian, in some cases with uh, severe hypotony, trauma, PVR, something like this. You know, um, let me let me share with you the first, the very first case. The very first case is a macro hole with disguises. You can see here, this is a 49 years all female with high myopia, right eye is 30 millimeters of axial length, left eye is 32.2 millimeters, and there is a posterior staphyloma mostly in the left eye of 2.4 millimeters in height, measured by B echography. And the patient came to me, uh, sent by this, by another surgeon just to, you know, think about macular buckling in a case with six months progressive visual loss and metamorphopsia. You can see visual acuity was 20 over 125. And as you can see uh, here, you have a posterior staphyloma, some RPE, uh, you know, disturbance in the posterior bone. And here you can see a full thickness macro hole with a sky, is the posterior high, the skis of posterior higher. Then, you know, this this was uh, three and a half years ago, and I was changing, doing you know, macular buckling for these cases, uh, to change to uh, do only in better flap for these cases. Then, you know, was my first case. I convinced the patient to to change because many surgeons say that you know you don't need macular buckling for these cases. And they say, okay, let's try. It. Let's make a series a series of cases doing this surgery without macular buckling. Then, you know, I convinced the patient. And I did my surgery. You know, this is a fake patient, as you can see. We did, you know, 23 gauge vitrectomy, and you can see we removed the vitreous there uh, with the three, uh, 23 gauge. I use only one light. You can see here something that may, may, may resemble, you know, the the white ring. And then we removed the vitreous by, you know, and it's very easy. Then I stain. I never use tiamcinolone. I have to tell you, all many surgeons in the world they use tiamcinolone. Uh, I always use brilliant blue, yes, from the from the very beginning. And then you can see here how you know the uh, posterior height is attached in the inferior arcade. You know, I think to speak about you know posterior vitreous detaching in these kind of in these kind of cases this is a mistake. You can see the macro hole there, and then. The posterior hyaluron in the majority of these cases, they stay attached to the retina. Even if you see a ring just floating in front of the optic disc that says wise ring, don't believe that you know the the the, the hyaluron is, is detached. Because this is the, the, the posterior hyaluron staining is very typical. 
you know, is irregularly staining, the, 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 you know, the, the posterior height is very elastic, it's difficult to control where you go, you, 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 you just pull and, you know, the posterior height comes to you. And here there are three questions for me, because there are many surgeons that say when there is these kind of cases, they try to remove the posterior hyaluronic to the extreme periphery in the cases of myopi myopic maculopathy, you know, and I, I tell you my opinion about this is not to do it, you know, I don't, I try to preserve, you know, the peripheral radia for any break, you know, I don't try to go to periphery because in these kind of cases, some, in some of them, they have very strong attachments of the posterior hyaluronic and they can, you can promote breaks and you convert a myopic maculopathy to a retinal detachment in a high myopic. This is a terrible thing. And what would be the next step? The next step for me is to re-stain, to re-stain to see perfect, you know, the internal limiting membrane. And this is, I always use only uh, Brilliant Blue. You see here, perfect, the uh, internal limiting membrane. And we start in the inferior part of the retina, as you can see here with the forceps. And then we make a rexis around the macro hole. I try to decrease the pinching numbers, you know, you, you not try to pinch and pinch. I try to, you know, make uh, the less pinch I, I, as possible. And then we put all these ILM around the macro hole. We are creating now the superior to inferior flap, just to cover, you know, the macro hole. My advice is don't press down. Don't, you don't need it. Don't try to put the, you know, the ILM inside the hole because you can promote, you know, RP lesions. Don't, don't press down, you leave it there. And then um, my question to you is, would anyone have done something else? Because there are some surgeons that say that in these holes, you know, the viscous fluid inside the hole perhaps prevents macro hole closing. You know, um, and, and I did, I, I, I went with my 41 gauge camera before to peel the ILM. I went to the, just inside the macro hole, you have to be very stable, just to, you know, exchange this vitreous, uh, you know, this viscous uh, uh, liquid uh, fluid inside the hole. And then after this, I started to build the ILM I showed you before. Okay, after this, we trim the ILM, as you can see here, how to trim the ILM. Lower your cutting rate and lower your suction. This is the most important thing. And then when you aspirate, you aspirate in the inferior part of the retina because all the fluid coming down from the peripheral retina, peripheral vitreous up and down, you know, make a current and maintains the flap, uh, the superior flap over the hole. You know, some surgeons they make, you know, uh, you know, the temporal flap, but you know, at the end, my, my patients leave the OR, you know, walking, then, you know, I prefer the flap to be from superior part to inferior part to be maintained there and to close the hole. And then I, I'm sure you're expecting a perfect close macro hole. And, you know, this is the perfect inverted flap, but, you know, the macro hole remain open. You know, this is four weeks after surgery. The, the patient was very angry with me because I convinced her to, to, to avoid, you know, macro buckling and only do this because many surgeons told me that, you know, uh, in many meetings, they say that you don't need to do it. You know, at the end, this little kitty was 20 over 200. And what's the next step? Well, the next step for me, first, why did it fail? You know, is, do you have any explanation about this? And uh, the next step, of course, uh, you know, uh, I did macro buckling in this case. And then, you know, macro buckling, just to remind you, uh, this is, uh, you open the super temporal quadrant, then you put a mattress suture point in the, the macro area where you, where you thing there is the macro area is not that easy because it's uh, you know huge variation and then i went there to yes yeah, to see how was my my inverted flap and my inverted flap was there was was perfect you know was over the hole and then i began to touch my flap and at the end i lost the flap you know the flap was a free flap and then to put the flap again inside the hole is so difficult uh, let me ask you what is this let me ask you, what is this bubble? You know, um, I, I, I expect your 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 answers. Then with two uh, flexible loop, I went there. This is not that easy. 
Then uh, the trick is to put again under the fluorocarbon liquid, the flap, and then very, very softly, you, you, uh, you drag this ILM flap uh, to put the, the flap into the hole. Look at, look at the, the, the bubble I showed you before. You know, this uh, gas bubble um, over the, the fluorocarbon liquid. Then we put this uh, macro buckle, I think is, is, is the best buckle, uh, this, the buckles I, I, I tried. There's a light in the landing platform. You can see the blue dot there. But at the end, when I remove the fluorocarbon liquid to final exchange, uh, then, you know, the blue dot disappears. And then I didn't have any any flap over the over the over the macro hole. Then you know I make a fluid exchange, SF6, 20%, and the macro hole was closed. You know, this liquidity was not fine. This is three years. And this is not the aspect of uh, three years. I don't have here's the 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 aspect of you know these cases, the skies have disappeared, but this liquidity remains in 20 over 100. You know, this is not a good result. But let me confess that you was my uh, my first case doing the bird flap in cases with macro hole and skysis. I, I, I did it with macro hole with other skysis a lot of time ago. You know, and the series continues. And as you can see here, we were able to close. This is the first case I showed you before. And as the series continues, uh, these are eight cases here that uh, we were able to close the macro hole well. To say to close the macro hole is, you know, you know, look at the last case. This is six months ago. And, and you know, this is a perfect visual kit is 2063. This is a very good uh, 20, uh, excuse me, it's not 20, uh, 20, um, um, 2032, and uh, Bisolokitu was was uh, very nice. 2032, as I told you, and you know the macro hole remains open. The patient, you know, has decreased metamorphosis and it's perfect. And we 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 are expecting this to close uh, spontaneously. The second case is a is, is a nightmare. Let me ask you about if you have seen any case like this. You know, this case is a macro hole without skies in a high myopia. This is a 53 years old female high myopia radial keratotomy when she was 18 years old and one year ago that she was operated cataract surgery and IL implantation. You know, she, she showed that uh, 15 days more visual loss and metamorphosis in the right eye. And this was 2050. Okay, we went to the surgery and this is a surgery. It's very similar to the case I showed before. And we do, uh, our, we perform our vitrectomy. We stand with brilliant blue, as I repeat, I don't use uh, Jamsinolon. Uh, to a stain, a stain is not a good word for this, but to stain the posterior hyoid, we start with the posterior hyoid. These are new forceps. I was trying, I was testing this new force. I didn't like it too much, but you know, I, I, I began with this, removing first the posterior hyoid again. And after this, we re-stain uh, to find the internal limiting membrane. At the end, we, we remove the internal limiting membrane. We create the inverted flap, superior flap to the inferior retina. As you can see here, don't press down, don't put the flap inside the hole, just a little bit you know, to the inferior side. Then you aspirate in the inferior part of the retina, as you can see here. And you know, the day after the aspect is this, you know, and this is a very good aspect. I do OCT the day after in all of my cases, all of my cases. And as you can see here, you can see the ILM there with the reflex of the gas in here. But you know, the aspect was good. You know, one, three weeks after the surgery, the gas had disappeared. The patient came to me and told me this liquidity was pretty poor, it was uh, around 2200. And she was telling me, you know, I asked central scotoma. I cannot see your face. I cannot read with this eye. And look at this, the OCT, the macro hole was closed. Uh, but there was this bumpy, you know, bumpy areas over the RPE. Perhaps you're thinking about subretinal membrane, but you know, this is not typical subretinal membrane. You can see many bumpy areas here over the RPE. And the patient said, my vision is very poor and my vision is worse than before. And perhaps you are asking me to, to show you an OCTA. The OCTA said nothing. You know, the, you know there, there were no coronal neovascularization in this case. Let me show you the, the autofluorescence in this case. It's a terrible, this was not before. This is a terrible RPE lesion, both in the posterior retina and the anterior retina. 
of course you are thinking about how, how is it, how, why, why did it happen? And perhaps you're thinking a toxic phenomenon, but you know, this is brilliant blue, this is the same brilliant blue I always use. There are many papers saying that brilliant blue is not toxic. And you know, the, the surgery was normal, was, you know, it takes uh, 30 minutes or run to, to, to do all the surgery. You know, uh, perhaps you think about phototoxicity, but remember here, is the place where where there is the that is the the entrance of the light that you are you never you point down to the peripheral retina then you know I think it's not possible to have phototoxicity. I always show this case in the meetings when I uh, when I speak about macro holes in high myopia because you know I'm, I'm trying to know why this patient developed this because the other eye is high myop then the other eye may show the same problem in the future. Um, only one surgeon in the world, my friend from India, from Delhi, that I sure of, showed me a case that, you know, it's not the same, you know, but uh, he had the same problem in a patient that he used brilliant blue from the same trademark. And look at this, he showed this bumpy, you know, uh, aspect over the RP. But you know, the aspect of these RP lesions are not the same. I'm not, you know, he, he, they respect the vessels as you can see here. And you know, um, I don't think it's the same, but you know, is the, if you have any case, please show me the case because I'm trying to know why it happened to my, my patient. Look at this, this is a comparison of the two cases. I, I think the distribution of the RP is really different. And I don't think it's any relationship, but you know, if you have any case, yes, um, show me. You know, in the third case, and the last thing I want to share with you is this. You know, uh, as a surgeon, we, we use these devices to control, you know, uh, edema or trying to increase the pressure. But in some cases with silicone will happen this. This is um, a case of, um, uh, uh, there was a PBR, this is the aspect after the surgery, after the retinotomy, I injected uh, osurex in the cavity and, you know, the osurex went over the retina. You don't want the osurex to be there. Or in some cases with a very back diaphragm, you can have these, uh, these devices in the chamber and you know the in the third chamber you have the problem of you know corneal edema discompensation etc uh, my advice if you have to use Osurex or Illuvian, because, you know, uh, in some cases we use Illuvian in very bad cases, um, you know, uh, off label, of course. We described in 2014, we described, we described how to, in these kind of difficult cases, to, uh, to uh, suture the, uh, the Osurex to describe. Very recently, this is in 2020, has been described the same technique. We, uh, one year ago, we, we, we had a case, we, we have um, do, done this three times with Illuvian. Let me, let me show you the first, the first case was one year ago in a case of uh, coming from PBR, was AFEC, was silicon oil, you know, a hypotenuse eye. We, we tried to recover and to increase the pressure in the eye then, you know, and then we did this. This is very simple to do. This is a 23 gauge knife. And then we put the, we remove the, the Illuvian from the injector. And then we use this, um, this suture to, yes, to make a, a knot and you, we put inside this, you have to be very careful because you, you can break it, right? Then and, um, we, we, we put it inside and then we, uh, we, we put it uh, total insight and then we put the conjunctiva over the over the this and that's everything uh, that's all that I, I want to share with you and um i'm trying to leave uh, thank you very much dr carlos on time um uh, uh, if there is any question from dear colleagues here dr saad dr carlos Bezizio, or ahmed to dr carlos or any comments I just have okay. one question, Carlos. Just uh, yeah, on your last case sure. that you're showing the sutured illuvian. Sure. You, do you push it all the way into the eye, so it, it's going to be fixated yeah. only at scleral level? How do how do you do that? Uh, I, I put it just to the sclera. You know, in the sclera, I put the suture over the sclera, but it remains 
in the, you know, it remains attached in the tunnel uh, of the sclera. Then uh, perhaps you think, okay, okay, you have less dosage inside the eye, but um, I, I do it like this. So the reason why I'm asking you that, Carlos, is a very specific reason for that. The implant only releases the drug from one end. Yeah. So you have to be sure that you're putting the other end first. Yeah. Yeah, we put the one to release the drug, second that you don't want to damage it. So that's an important thing for the others mm -hmm. to consider. You have to put it in the right position, otherwise it doesn't work. You're absolutely right. And then in sometimes we put the implant through the uh, through the canvas, not 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 suture. Sure. We we put inside the, the trockers and then we remove the canvas and then we leave it in the scrap. But as, as you mentioned, it's very important to put it, uh, you know, uh, with, with the end, the correct end. No, not the is, the, uh, is there any, any, any sign for the anterior or posterior side of the illuvian? So you can judge this yeah. is the, the, the area. We, we remove it, we remove it from this range, then we grasp it, and then we put it in the correct position as it enters in the-, in the I mean, if it is moved in your hand, there will be no way to see which one is the site of releasing? No, no. I mean, but, but, but you have an experience. Yeah. Re remember the, the, the bit of the illusion that will release the drug is the trailing end from the injector. So the bit that is going first is, is the dead end. The, the end, the, the, yeah. right? So sure. if you're going to remove from the cartridge to use that way, you have to turn it around. You have to reverse the order because otherwise you get the wrong end. So normally when you inject, the bit that goes first is the dead end. The release end is the trailing end. So it's when you remove one. it from but the cartridge, mean, you have to yeah. turn it. No, I mean, if in case you're, it's there in your hands, there is any sign to, to know which is? No. no. I'll no. tell you, I haven't tried to do that. So I, I don't know visually <laughs> if I would be able any to. Any other comment? Okay. Is there any I just, I, yeah, I need just to ask, uh, thank you, Carlos. It's very interesting cases. Uh, I just, I'm excited to know the result of the last case, uh, what's happened after you put the Leuven in such an uh, interesting well, way. You know, um, in, the, in this, when we use, when we, we use Illuvian in these kind of cases, these are cases that we are trying to increase intraocular pressure yeah. and to decrease the retinal edema. I have to tell you, I have the, I have the load three times and okay. one, only one case increase five millimeters of mercury in intraocular pressure. I think pre intraocular pressure is our, uh, for me, is our, my worst problem in severe cases, PBR and, you know, in, in, in these cases that you have uh, one, two, three millimeters of mercury. What, what, one, one, more, one more point. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Dr. No, 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 go ahead, this one. Yeah, I'm just asking about the, you know, uh, we all know that the micular hole in uh, posterior staphyloma with myopic, it's a challenging case, you know, and you presented it very uh, nicely. And uh, I know that uh, one of the tricks that you have to peel the ILM until the edge of the staphyloma to uh, yeah. avoid that. that. Yeah. And uh, one, one, you know, one of the most challenging, uh, one of the most reason, common reason that, uh, because for sure you, you position in the patient post-operatively, right? Because you need to have a gas bubble to fill all the staphyloma space. Uh, do you think that uh, suturing the sclerotomy, uh, it will uh, add, make sure that you are going home, you know, we are, you are feeling that there is no, because if you have any leak on the first post-operative days, the pressure of the gas inside the eye, it would be might soft. And then you might, especially are using 23 gauge, or you don't have this kind of uh, point in your mind while you are dealing with it. Very good question. Uh, look at this, in the, in the staphyloma, when you are doing these cases, you, you have two objectives. This is different to idiopathic macro holes. In idiopathic macro holes, you want to release the traction around the hole. This is no problem. Okay, in these cases, it's different. You are trying to, increase the retinal elasticity. Remember that the ILM is the most tough of the, of the yeah. retina, more rigid part of the retina yeah. among the vessels, you know, the, the, the arcades. 
but you know in this case i i go around to the to the to the border to the edge of this safflona trying to increase as much as possible you know the the retinal elasticity this is this is first um, answer the second is the gas i use is sf6 20% sf6 20% in my experience is a little bit expensive but you know at the end i do a, something special in the sclerotomies and if i feel that you know the eye remains stable I, I don't suture, but in many cases, I suture to be sure that, uh, you know, the, eye, the day after will have more than three quarters part of the vitreous cavity full of gas. Because yeah. some, some surgeons in idiopathic macular cases say, okay, I, I only use air. Okay, yeah. that is perfect, but you have to have, you know, the eye full of air. Yeah, yeah, and, sure. And, and, um, okay, thank you, Ahmed, because we are having, you know, we are running behind the time, and we have many of our dear uh, friends, they are attendees, and they are a well-known international speaker, and they uh, want to ask a question. I will give two uh, for this time. Uh, I have Dr. Nicola Ghazi, Dr. Nicola, we are uh, happy that you are with us. Can you open the mic for Dr. Nicola to give his question? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting presentations. Can, can you hear me? Yeah, no, we sorry. are hearing you, Dr. Nicola. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Hello to all the dear friends and colleagues. I hope you are all safe and fine. I just Same wanted to you. comment on the... Thank you. I just wanted to comment on the uh, alluvian suturing to the sclera. You know, I've seen a different technique than the one that Carlos described, uh, and I, uh, I kind of like it because you don't have to worry about which end is inside the eye. This technique actually sutures the alluvian circumferentially uh, in the pars plana. So after the alluvian goes all the way in, uh, actually the alluvian uh, implant is sutured outside the eye, a slip knot is put around it, then the implant is thrown inside the eye, and then it's sutured just like we suture a haptic to the, uh, to the uh, edges of the, uh, of the sterile wound. Uh, and uh, it lies flat on the past plana internally. There's no part of it that stays outside. And I was wondering if Carlos has an experience with this or any of the uh, speaker. No, but this is a good idea. I think it's a, it's a perfect idea, and and you know this uh, avoids the problem that uh, Carlos mentioned uh, to to have too much. And many in many cases you, you, you don't see at the end you suture the, the the sclera over the implant. You don't see anything. But you know uh, you know this is a concern that you know, I agree with Carlos that, that that may be a problem. But you know. Uh, the suturing uh, for these kind of cases, uh, and, uh, we are talking about severe retinal, you know, with retinal problems, you know, uh, this is not about uveitis, this is a, a big problem for severe cases, and I think it may help some of them, traumatic cases, for example, trying to increase the intraocular pressure, uh, although you know, uh, you know, the, the main reason of hypotony perhaps is not inflammation. But you know, in some cases, may help to, to increase the pressure. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Carlos. Uh, Dr. Nicola, thank, thank you very much for your. Uh, thank you very your much. Thank you, Dr. Us. Anyway, Dr. Nicola is, is all the times he's having a, a good, uh, I mean, all innovations for something uh, regarding with retinal, well known figures in the Middle East and with retinal. Thanks for sharing with us your experience. Uh, I will have now Dr. Saad with his question, then I will have. Also, another question from one of attendees. Uh, Dr. Saad, if you want to, to comment or to do. Uh, no, no, it was just um, a great cases uh, from both uh, uh, Ahmed and uh, Carlos. I was just wondering what type of suture you would use uh, when you're suturing uh, it's these proline. implants. It's proline. Proline, okay. Proline, yeah. Okay, so can we have Dr. Safwan Bayati for uh, a question from uh, yeah, live, please, Dr. Safwan? Yeah, hi, hi, Dr. Mohammed. Hello, Dr. Safan. Most welcome. Dear friends. Please. I just need to, to thank uh, Dr. Mohammed first and the old speakers for a very nice presentation, especially, especially Dr. Ahmed and all, all of them, really all of them. I enjoyed all, all the, the presentation. But I need to like to, to, to thank Dr. Carlos for a very important point that he highlighted related to the Tripani Blue. Now, a uh, few points because uh, I do agree with, with, with you, Dr. Carlos, that in few cases that when, you are, when we are using the trypan blue 
once and twice and three times in the same case to highlight especially a very thin, uh, delicate, especially in high myope with the posterior staphyloma. So uh, I had also the same cases that one of them presented to me with the, with the same uh, R RPE changes. And uh, uh, definitely at that time, uh, when, when you ask yourself what's happened, I asked myself the same issues, but uh, it's, it's, it's very clear. There's two issues, the, the trypani blue and phototoxicity. I don't think so that phototoxicity can ever create such a changes in trypani blue, in, in, in RPE. So mostly it's a trypani blue. I don't know whether is, you have any solution in your mind, any options to change, return back to the uh, uh, ICG or, um, uh, uh, or any other material that will be safer than, than <laughs> trypani blue? Let me tell you, I don't use tripan blue. I abandon tripan blue. This is okay. brilliant blue. This is okay. not okay. tripan blue. I, I, I never use okay. tripan blue. I'm saying, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, you are taking it from, from which company? This uh, it was Zork. It it's was Zork. Yeah, 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 it was Zork. And yes, the case okay. from India was Zork. But I, I, I'm not sure that this is. I, I, the thing I think is perhaps a personal, you know, a relation with the dye. You know, the, uh, you know, the characteristics of the patient of the RPE. But, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, I haven't seen with, uh, with Brilliant Blue, uh, if, you, if you look at the literature, you, will, you won't find any uh, paper that says that, you know, to the RPE, right. toxic. Okay, right. You are right. Because okay, I thank you very much, uh, Ahead, uh, please. Uh, we have uh, only one more question. Dr. Jamal Tendari, please. Can we have Dr. Jamal? Dr. Jamal Kendari, a vitreo retinal surgeon, dear friends from Al Kuwait. Um, if you have a comment, are you there, Dr. Jamal? Can you open the mic for Dr. Jamal, please? Yes, I'm waiting for him. Dr. Jamal, can you open your mic from your side? Okay, if not, uh, so we can keep to the end. Now I want to introduce my dear friend. Uh, okay, you find him. If you find him before we introduce Dr. Saad, it will be great. Okay, can you close um, any others, please? Close, uh, close the mic for others, uh, except our uh, speakers. Okay. So now we will uh, have uh, Dr. Saad Wahib, uh, is my dear friend, and he is a consultant ophthalmologist, associated professor of ophthalmology, Kunja Abdul Aziz University, College of Medicine, head section of ophthalmology, King Faisal Specialist, Specialist Hospital and Research Center in Saudi Arabia. Uh, please, Dr. Fahad, go ahead, share your slide and start. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Muhammad. It's always a pleasure um, to be with you. I'm, I'm just going to, for the sake of time, uh, go ahead and close with my cases. I'll, uh, I've got uh, two or three cases, uh, which are a combination of medical and surgical retina. This was a 70-year-old, uh, you know, usual diabetic, as Ahmed was saying. Most of our patients, unfortunately, are fully controlled. She came in to see us with a decreased vision in both eyes. She's pseudophagic and uh, you know, she, she was not comfortable with the idea of having monthly injection after trying to convince her. She got two um, um, anti-VEGF, uh, we used um, earlier in this case, and the vision did, uh, you can see uh, the edema in both eyes, more uh, so in the uh, left eye. Uh, with the um, anti-VEGF, um, Ali injection, if liver said she improved uh, in the right eye, but she did not uh, show um, major improvement in the left eye and at that stage, I discussed with her if she is not willing to come monthly, the possibility of, uh, uh, of um, a steroid implant and uh, we decided to go ahead and use a DEX implant in both eyes. Uh, you can also see uh, looking at the OCTs in both eyes, the um, usual OCT by markers of inflammation in the form of uh, subretinal uh, fluid, the uh, hyperreflectile uh, dots and the uh, systole changes. The right eye actually did very well um, and the vision did improve, but the left eye, uh, this is just a technical point as uh, Ahmed was saying, when you're injecting uh, dexamethasone, you want to, um, just like uh, when you uh, insert the trochas during the trachectomy, 
you uh, stay at an angle first, and that's very important. And that is different from Elegan, as you'll see in a second. And um, I routinely uh, inspect these patients after injection. So as I said, her right eye did show an improvement, was very stable, but the left eye recurred after four months. Uh, her IOP, which I usually check in the second month or after then in the middle of the um, second month, uh, remained very stable. And um, she was still not comfortable with the concept of using anti-VEGF uh, monthly injections. We decided that we're going for DEX, um, for the second DEX to the left eye, but for a reason she traveled abroad, uh, I think for knee surgeries and she received their, um, the Illuvine implant. She came in to see me after almost a year um, after the Illuvine and she looked actually pretty well. She's the macular edema, her right eye remains stable, but the left eye, this is her left eye, which has shown um, a definite improvement with improvement of the visual acuity. And at that, that stage, I, I um, consulted her on using combination therapy and um, uh, injecting her with um, anti uh, uh, twice, and she's done well. Uh, she said she came last week to see me. It was very interesting because I had her um, uh, almost three year um, uh, uh, pictures, and she looked pretty well, actually. And that uh, gives us an idea of the stability of the um, Illuvian implant in, in, in these uh, inflammatory uh, uh, cases. Uh, whereby uh, you can see the improvement both uh, anatomically and functionally. And again, just a, a technical point here, when you're injecting Elevine, you can see that you want to be perpendicular. Uh, whereas in uh, DEX, uh, you come at an angle. And I think that probably um, uh, an important technical point. Uh, things that I, I, I wanna, uh, the take home message from this is that uh, um, I think we're not uh, switching early. And I think uh, switching early is very important in these patients. If you keep on injecting anti -VEGF, I know in this patient, this was a compliance issue, but I've seen uh, people who've continued injecting anti -VEGF for six or 12, or sometimes more than that. Uh, I think you ultimately get thinning uh, of the retina, but the vision is lost. So I think switching early is important for the functional improvement that you want to get. Uh, combination therapy is important. I was really um, impressed with the results that uh, Dr. Ahmed presented because in, in, in my experience and internationally, um, uh, the um, uh, Elevin implant would require at least six to eight weeks to show an improvement. And sometimes during the course, you might have to use top up uh, either in the form of um, uh, DEX or even anti -VEGF. Um, and um, this is what I'm saying here. Uh, the second case, I'm just gonna move into the second case was a 42 year old um, female, uh, nice educated, uh, she's pregnant in her second trimester. This was a very precious uh, pregnancy. She came in with blurred vision in her left eye for a few weeks. She's known hypertensive under control. Her visual acuity was uh, 2020, 20, 2100 in the other eye with very mild hyperopic astigmatism, uh, normal IOP, normal anterior segment. Uh, her fundus examination, including the optus, looked uh, initially pretty um, okay. Uh, her OCT showed classically uh, the um, um, macular edema uh, with, you know, classic subretinal fluid and systolic changes. When I went back to look into her, uh, carefully into her left uh, fundus exam, I could see uh, like an old um, uh, vein occlusion, which is probably uh, resulted in this after consulting with the patient because of her pregnancy. I was worried. Uh, in using anti -VEGF, we agreed to use dexamethasone, which is done uh, pretty well. And um, it's my experience, and um, I don't know about uh, what the uh, panelists think, but uh, these patients, the uh, vein occlusion patients, respond very well to the um, uh, steroid implant. Of course, uh, um, um, uh, we agreed that after delivery, she might go back and use anti-VEGF. Um, anti um, I think I just wanted to stress the um, importance of the OCT biomarkers. You want to look at them. Um, we're considering now naive patients sometimes. Uh, uh, you want to look at these uh, serious retinal detachments, the presence of hyperreflective dots and uh, systolic changes, uh, which are all suggestive um, of the fact that these patients might not uh, be good responders to um, anti-VEGF. And uh, you know, all the studies, whether it's uh, the um, uh, real uh, life uh, studies or the randomized trial, have shown that you have approximately one third of patients who will not uh, respond well uh, to your anti-VEGF, and I think you should keep steroids in the back of your mind, and I think switching early is, is a key. I'll take you um, into a third case, which is more of a surgical case. This was a 50-year-old uh, gentleman who comes to see me referred after having um, eight anti-VEGF injection with not 
major improvement of his macular edema. Um, and uh, he's also had uh, some evidence of PDR. So uh, we agreed that we're going to treat this with surgery. And I think uh, surgery is an option that should be kept at the back of your mind. And we need to understand that uh, some patients are tractional. Uh, so no matter how much injections you give them, uh, you ultimately need to go for uh, surgery. I'll show you um, quickly the procedure. Uh, I, I, I decided to keep um, uh, the lens um, and um, um, I'm in, in, uh, I routinely in these patients, uh, this was just a cord vitrectomy. You can see the tractional um, uh, uh, component on the macula. I, I routinely use tramcinolone. I know Dr. Uh, Carlos does not uh, like to use them, but I find them very useful, specifically in diabetics. Uh, you know, uh, they show you the vitreous. There's a lot of vitreous cases. You can see here, I'm trying to induce a PVD. Uh, you want to be um, slow. You want to take um, your time, you allow some hydration. And then uh, slowly you can see a little bit of uh, bleeding that is usually managed well with increasing the intraocular pressure and ultimately you will uh, do the um, uh, uh, PVD. Um, and then after that, uh, I leave a little bit of this tramcinolone as an anti-inflammatory. So it truly helps, uh, especially in these um, diabetics, they always have these uh, vitreous a little bit of um, endo laser also. And then um, uh, I do a fluid exchange and I leave them with, uh, with air. Um, so it's just a few tips, uh, practical tips for inducing PVD. We know that PVD in diabetics is, uh, is somewhat a difficulty. I think visualization is very important when you're um, inducing PVD. You want to make sure you're seeing everything very carefully. Uh, you would like to start at the edge of the disc and you move up. And this is one of the uh, mistakes that we see with some of the junior uh, staff or the uh, newcoming fellows. You, they, they tend to pull towards the sclerotomy. You want to move up and you would like to be patient, give some time for hydration, and then you will see that it will come um, uh, slowly. And um, I think uh, everybody is going into smaller gauge and it definitely uh, going into smaller gauge means that you're gonna get closer to the retina, but I think you would like to be careful because smaller gauge does not mean smaller problem. And um, if there is a retinal attachment, in these cases, sometimes you have either combined uh, tractional, retinotogenous or tractional, you always want to start facing the attached retina. So going back to the patient, she initially showed um, reasonable improvement within two months, his vision improved, still had some evidence of uh, macular edema. And at that stage, uh, because he's phakic, we decided uh, that we're going to use um, uh, anti-VEGF. I use again, um, a fibrocet. And after three injections, the macular edema kept on fluctuating. And then I told him uh, that, you know, you've got a little bit of cataract. There's a good chance that you're going for surgery. So we decided that we're going to Azodex after discussing the possibility of surgery. The IP remained normal and he responded actually very well and his vision is improved now. One of the points that I wanted to raise is that these patients after vitrectomy, uh, the half-life of anti-VEGF is much reduced. So the effect is going to wear much faster and thereafter the um, concept of uh, uh, long-acting uh, depot. Uh, medications like Azodex is, is definitely important. And uh, this brings us to this uh, point of the mean retinal thickness amplitude, which is an interesting point uh, that has been brought up, uh, which I think uh, Dr. Carlos in his first uh, and also Dr. Ahmed alluded into it. Uh, you see, when you inject, when you treat these patients, the fluctuation that happens in retinal thickness is somehow somewhat uh, damaging each time uh, the retina, the macula, like a sponge swells and decompresses, you get some damage. And I think the mean uh, changes that you see with the uh, elephant implant is definitely less. And in a study that showed that the uh, changes prior to the insertion of the implant were around uh, uh, 230 micron, while with the implant is 96 micron. So we would like to have a stable uh, control, which uh, definitely um, is, um, is, is achievable with the uh, elephant implant. I think that takes me to the end. Uh, uh, this is uh, nobody is in the um, in the Corniche, like in, and hopefully um, once we get this COVID-19 uh, problem over, uh, we will go back and enjoy it. And I hope everybody stay safe and and uh, inshallah we will uh, get over this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Saad. Uh, it's for this uh, very interesting cases and at the same time uh, on a time. Properly, thanks a lot. Can you just uh, 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 do a slide? Um, sure. Yeah. Stop sharing. Stop sharing. Yeah, please. So we can have, if there is any question from dear friends here available to Dr. Saad about these cases, presentation, or whatever, then we are having many questions from many dear friends live. 
and we will start prepare Dr. Madafra uh, to, to, to talk with us, but after any question from the dear, dear friends. Dr. Badizio, if Dr. Carlos, uh, Dr. Ahmed, any comments? Can you just please remove the, the, the mute? You are on mute, Dr. Carlos, Badizio, and Matthew. Okay. So any question to Dr. Saad, any comments? This, this one thing in, in the surgical point of view, okay, when you mention how you remove the posterior hyoid, the, the, for me, this is one problem, let me tell you, uh, the new vessels on the optic disc, because if you remove the posterior hyoid and the new vessel of the, op of the optic disc, then you cannot apply diathermy. You, you can increase the pressure, but the, many of these cases, the day after they have vitreous hemorrhage, then uh, the thing I do always is trying to preserve there is if there is if there are big uh, you know vessels in the optic disc as you mentioned i remove the posterior hyoid and i leave there a piece of tissue yes to put diathermy diathermy is not very uh, profound effect you know it's very it's very superficial then you can do this you know this diathermy in the vessels of the optic disc trying not to affect of the optic disc of course but leaving some tissue in the optic disc trying to avoid the day after uh, a vitreous hemorrhage perhaps you leave gas but you know at the end you leave gas but you know the gas is disappearing and you have more blood 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 then the patient you know 3 weeks 4 weeks with recurrent vitreous hemorrhage then in these cases, I try always, my, my, my advice always, the, the mistakes I make every year and every time is trying to remove this to have a perfect picture of the patient without any US. Then I always try to leave an island of tissue around the optic disc. Uh, I, I remove the ILM just to avoid the contraction of this tissue to drag the fovea. But um, uh, I think leaving some tissue around the, you know, the traction is good for diathermy and to avoid post-operative vitreous hemorrhage. Oh, sure, uh, I could not you, agree Roman. more. Yeah, yeah, I could not agree more. And I think what we usually do, uh, definitely sometimes you would pre-treat these patients with anti-VEGF yeah. a couple of days before surgery. And definitely, you know, uh, as I said, visualization is important if you see a vessel you think it might bleed, definitely you'd like to use endodiathermy or sometimes even endolaser, but you want to be careful and I truly agree with this. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Carlos, uh, uh, because we are having, uh, can you, uh, John, please open the mic for Dr. Uh, Madaf, is available. At the same time, meanwhile, uh, I want just to apologize for not to give my uh, talk because I'm not lucky to do today to give this talk in uh, present of these eminent speakers, uh, but maybe in the future, maybe I have a chance to, to do that. And this because of the sake of the time. Yes, Dr. Madaf, yes, can you go ahead? Uh, good evening, Dr. Mohamed, and good evening, rest of the speakers and Dr. Carlos Matthew. My question was to Dr. Carlos Matthew. I think he was trying to answer my question. Uh, this is regards to our first case, uh, uh, which he showed of a myopic tractional maculopathy. My question was, is there any classification and staging of myopic tractional maculopathy followed? And if so, does it really help? I mean, in, in deciding which patient should be taken up for macular buckle and second for vitreous surgery. Okay, uh, I, 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 I answer in the, in the chat, but you know, I, I, I have three cases. One is ischisis. And in this case, you have three versions. You have progressive ischisis. These are patients that they don't have, you know, foveal detachment or inner defects in the fovea. This is a progressive. So are, these patients, normally they don't have lost vision. You know, they, they, they can have good vision for, you know, many years. But, you know, they start to lose vision with foveal detachment. And then if they show, then I call this foveal detachment. And the third is when they have this, you know, foveal inner defect. Then for me, there are three different cases. I don't try to, to say, okay, tangential traction, anterior posterior traction, because, you know, this is only one cut. You don't have the, the, the whole image of the old macula. You know, there are many tractions. There's the ILM, there are the vessels, so many tractions in the myo. Depends on the type of the staphyloma. The second thing is to classify the macro holes in two. You know, macro hole without disguises, I show you two cases, and macro hole with disguises. I see every one case of macro hole with disguises, I operate 30 cases of macro hole 
with the skysis. Then the uh, macro hole without the skysis are more frequent sin than macro hole with skysis. And the third problem with, in this high myops is macro hole retinal detachment. This is for me the classification. Trying to find, you know, a classification of the traction and all of this stuff for me is so difficult because every myop is different. You make an OCT and you see one traction from there, one traction from here, you know, it's, it's so difficult. Then for me, these are the three main cases about the macro buckles. Now, you, you know, I, I only use macro buckles for cases where they have retinal detachment related to a macro hole with a profound, with very steep, you know, posterior staphyloma. Because and you, and you can ask me why I started in 2004 and now in 2020, I, I, I changed. I changed because we learned a lot in the surgeon. We, we learned how to distinguish between the posterior hyaloid and the ILM. We improve our visualization during the surgery. Then all of these improvements have made that, you know, the anatomical prognosis have improved. But, you know, functional prognosis in high myops is difficult. It's not in, we thank haven't improved that much. Uh, thank you, so, Dr. Carlos. Uh, because of sake of time, we need only a very short as possible the answer. I know there is, sorry. you can go the long. Thank you for your information. Uh, we are having, uh, can you open the mic for the Dr. Mamata Mital? Mamata Mital. Meanwhile, I have one question. Uh, for Dr. Ahmed. Uh, Dr. Ahmed, I think your case with unilateral macular edema uh, is, uh, um, she is young and basically she is a case of badger disease or you have to rule, uh, or do you have to rule out infection like TB or syphilis? Uh, we have uh, many cases like that. Any comment? Okay. Dr. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I believe if you look at the, I, I didn't show the fluorescein angiography of the other eye, but the other eye was also there was a macroaneurysm, and if you look at the the uh, the FFA, it was a leaking macroaneurysm, typical case, no vasculitis, no vitreous haze. Uh, also, the the patient is uh, almost 55, I think, years old, and it's for me, it's there is no signs of uveitis in this case. Uh, it was a straightforward case, uh, the case of uh, the DME because the fluorescein angiograph showed that there is no signs of acid or TB, and there is no signs or symptoms of flare or EC cells or something like that. So it, uh, I don't think so it's a case of uveitis, but uh, it's a good point to consider. Maybe, yes, I agree that some cases may mimic the, the, the situation, but in my case, I believe it. Uh, I also am I'm ha very happy to hear other comments from my colleagues if they have any other thoughts. Especially Dr. Carlos uh, from UK is oh, so sorry, yeah, from Carlos UK is a uh, so he might have uh, and sort of input about this. Okay, this is question actually to Dr. Uh, Carlos Pavizio. What would you uh, repeat Illuvian injection once you see the edema is recurring after one year, or uh, you would uh, give uh, other decks, I think, uh, the top up, or you would go for Illuvian, uh, or you have to wait three years. Uh, this is my, I, I think, clarification. I think for you to propose a new intervention will be dictated by the clinical response. So if you're seeing recurrence of the edema after one year, so it means that your intervention is not working as you expected. So the duration of the intervention is not working. So the, the options are either because there is an issue with activity of the disease for which the illusion is not sufficient. So you need to give this patient a top up with the hope that this will settle down again and the illusion can continue the control. So one alternative you have in this case is I wouldn't give another illusion in this case, but I would maybe give a Nozodex on top of the illusion to induce control of that event and then see what happens when you pull back. Remember in the trial data I showed you, there were recurrences in the 36 months, but when you look at the group treated with the implant, most patients had one event, sometimes two events throughout the 36 months. So a rescue for that event at one year may very well induce control and allow the implant to work for the rest of the time. So it's worthwhile exploring a rescue therapy, as you would say, for the trial in using an Ozrodex and then see what happens after the Ozrodex expires. Okay, this is a question from my side, actually. Uh, uh, what is the, I mean, when do you think, or top up, what is the, the time? Do you have, uh, I mean, from your experience, 
after how many months you will start thinking of top up? Well, no, I, I think the, it's not a, the, the, the top up that I mentioned now. It would depend on the recurrence being clinically visible. So you, you give an implant. If there is no response, that's a different story. If yeah. there's zero response, then there is a problem there, which may be that disease, that condition is not responsive. But if you see a response and then you see failure, that's when I go for a top-up. Okay. So uh, do you think, I mean, whenever you start to see, for example, if they give Illuvian and still we have only, and there is an improvement within one month or two months, then one of a sudden you saw after the third month, for example, there is a deterioration. You will give a top up even after three months, or you have to wait again to uh, uh, after maybe uh, two again two months maybe to see more results. Or no, if if you let's say you you see the some of the, the examples I showed, the patients may respond depending on the nature of the problem. The response may be faster or a bit slower. Some patients respond very quickly, so within a few weeks you can see the benefit of the implant. In other patients, it may take a few more weeks. The point is, if you see a response, if you see the benefit and then you have a, a escape of control, no matter how long after the implant, you may rescue that patient with whatever strategy you want, either local or systemic, and then see what happens once you bring it under control again. So the real issue is lack of response to the first injection. If there's no response, then it may very well be that it's not gonna work, then you may have to abandon that strategy and use your regular strategies. But sometimes one injection or another treatment to bring it down and see what happens may be worthwhile. I have seen very few failures, primary failures. I've seen probably only one or two patients who have not responded, in which case I have to reconsider what I do and, and decide case by case. Okay. Uh, one question, but a very fast answer, please. Uh, could you please give uh, us a sign of uh, indicating inflammation uh, in, in, uh, CM, in clinical uh, macular edema, significant macular edema? Who is that question for? For you, please. Oh, for me. So what is, please repeat that. It's uh, uh, there is, what is the, the, the sign indicating yeah. inflammation? Well, the re meaning in general terms, inflammation uh, posterior segment. Well, most probably in diabetic macular edema. Okay, well, the macular edema in inflammation has several different behaviors. If you look at uh, angiographically and OCT, you can have a more cystoid, but you many times have very diffuse edema. The presence of subretinal fluid in these patients has not the same impact or the same meaning that you have in diabetic macular edema, in which you clearly said it is a sign of a, a more aggressive disease or prognostically different for the anti-VGF. In the uveitis, it doesn't mean that. Subretinal fluid in the sub location just doesn't just means treat the edema as you would normally treat. So not many times edema can occur because you're having vasculitis or sometimes because you have a, a vasculitis involving the posterior pole, or because you're having more diffuse vasculitis, or even a anterior uveitis, which is going on for a long time, can generate macular edema. And those okay. tend to be more localized than the others that are more diffuse. Uh, can we have now a live question? Uh, there is a Dr. Uh, Mamata Vital. Can you find it? If not, please go to Ahmed Khalaf, please. Mr. Owen. Okay, Dr. Ahmed, can you open the mic, Dr. Ahmed, and start please? Uh, after Dr. Ahmed, we are having Dr. Carter, uh, please, can you uh, make ready after Dr. Ahmed? Dr. Ahmed? Okay, Dr. Ahmed Khalaf, can you open the mic, please? Uh, I, I already posted my question in the in the written one, so thanks a lot. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ahmad. Okay, can you uh, have Dr. Carter, please? Dr. Muhammad, just uh, to clarify, uh, yes, when you Dr. ask... Uh, when you asked Dr. Carlos uh, about the top-up, he was meaning top-up in uveitis or top-up in DME or...? No, in DME. I was talking DME. about yeah, DME. Ah, okay. oh, so sorry. So I got it. UVI is my response was UVI is based, not DME. No, <laughs> yeah. uh, we are thinking about that. That's maybe Ahmadi concentrate more than me. I'm concentrated. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
you have any any comment on DME more? Carter, you, Dr. Carter, you yeah, can start. We are hearing if you are there. Chabra, Dr. Carter Chabra. Okay, if not, can we go to the next, please, Mr. Wayne? Uh, Stingo, uh, Titana. Okay, Carlos, can you give us an answer to this question meanwhile? Because, um, uh, Dr. Carlos, like one proposed in Italy, especially by Dr. Barbara Baraluni, vertical or perpendicular traction or tangential traction. This for Carlos uh, Macha. Can you comment on that? Uh, you know, uh, as I mentioned before, for me, it's, uh, I, 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 I answered before. Uh, for me, trying to um, uh, to classify the traction for me has no any utility. Has no any for me. Okay. Barbara is a good friend, and and she does it perfect. But okay. you know, I, a I, different I, a different school, different. Uh, 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 well, you know, okay. uh, yeah. Okay. Perhaps it's this, but you know. He's trying to put doors in the heaven, you know, he tried to, to compare all my ups and, you know, so uh, they are so different. The type of the staphyloma, the deepness of the staphyloma, you know, um, it's very difficult for me, you know, to follow okay. these many different groups. Can you open the mic for, for her, please? Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, can we have also Dr. Ahmed uh, Barti? We have one question of you. With your last yeah. case, do you think uh, to do a focal laser, photocoagulation under fluorescein angiography? or to try uh, retinal micro-pulse laser uh, by uh, Navilas. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Uh, talking about laser, actually, I think uh, most of us agree now the the result of, uh, of laser and the macula in diabetic does not have any, uh, I mean, the result is very poor compared to the pharmacotherapy, generally speaking. About uh, multi uh, uh, micro-pulse, sorry, I think I don't have any uh, experience uh, we need, I think, uh, more uh, data to prove that. Uh, is it improving the vision or not? And also, if you do a focal laser in this case, it's, a, it's, totally, it's a very close to the to the, to, to the fovea, so fovea la vascular zone. So I don't think that uh, will help. But for microbals, I don't have experience. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Just to remind here, colleagues here who is, they are listening to us, uh, there, is, there will be a survey. Please, you have to uh, answer this, uh, to fill up uh, the survey and send back. So according to that survey, they will send for you the uh, CME accreditation. Uh, this question, any indication of anti-BGF in SLE? Uh, any comment? I think this Carlos, that is it. SLE is it. Sorry, can you, I'm, I'm having trouble with you all. Can you repeat the question, please? Any indication of anti-BGF in uh, SLE? SLE. Systemic, yeah, systemic lupus erythematosus. No, well, SLE is a microvasculopathy. It's not truly an inflammatory problem when you see the back of the eye involved. It's mainly vascular occlusion. So what you see, many are cotton spots. You, you don't tend to see a proper inflammatory event. So I don't think that the, the management of SLE will be a systemic management. It means if you see the changes in the back of the eye, it's because a systemic disease is misbehaving and the treatment is systemic to prevent the damage to the eye. Another question, usually illuvian effect lasts for two to three years, according to the study. One of the patients developed macular edema after seven months. Is it common? Kindly comment. I think we talk about this one, but... Yes. Um, yeah, I, I think we, we are seeing a spectrum of behaviors. We are seeing the patients who are going the distance, they're fulfilling the, the three years. We are seeing patients who are having shorter duration of the effect. Uh, but it's less common to see failures early on. I think this few months not working is uncommon. Let's put it that okay. way. Another question also. Have you seen any time when Ozertex was effective but no change with Iruvian implant? And so patient was again shifted to Ozertex. I think they are here talking about shift not to top up. Okay, well... The one thing I've mentioned many times when discussing with people is that I find Ozodex is a more powerful drug in the point of view of the more acute impact. It, it works faster, it's probably more potent. Maybe the Alimera people I've spoken to don't necessarily agree with that, but I tend to see a more powerful effect of Ozodex early on. So it does mean that potentially some diseases need a higher dose for a, a certain time to get control. 
So there are situations in which maybe the Ozordex will be very good and the Illuvian may not fulfill the same same impact. And that is possibility in some cases. So it's, it's not always predictable that someone who responds to Ozordex will necessarily always respond to Illuvian. Do we have Dr. Saad Wahid here with us? Dr. Still Saad, we are with us. Yes, yes, I'm here. Uh, Dr. Saad, uh, can you, th there is a question. Uh, do you have, I mean, th the question we asked before, um, I mean, the sign of uh, inflammation on OCT due to diabetic macular edema? Yeah, I, I think, Yanni, uh, this has been looked uh, before and has been, I think, um, illustrated as I've shown. Uh, you know, there are certain signs that you can see, even sometimes from the beginning, uh, you can see these uh, changes that are on OCT, like the presence of subretinal fluid, the uh, HRF, uh, the hyperreflectile dots, um, and the systolic changes. I think they are all suggest uh, the presence of inflammation. Now, this does not necessarily mean that you would start with uh, steroids, but definitely you will have um, a lower threshold. Uh, for keeping these patients on anti-VEGF or for switching um, into uh, steroids. Okay. Uh, we have one question for anyone who wants to answer. Any systemic effect, uh, affection of intravitreal steroid in diabetic patients? So when we are giving uh, dexamethasone or Illuvian, is there any effect? No, no, no issues. There's no concern about systemic. The, the drug will be detected in the blood, but it's yeah. a very small amount. Not Nothing to impact... Any other opinion? It's the same for Dr. Saad, Dr. Ahmad, okay? Yeah, yeah, I think there is no, it does not sure that, yeah. Okay, because I see this several times, so I want to assure that, that there is no uh, effect or systemic effect. Mm -hmm. uh, last but, question, when will you say that Illuvian is not responding or there is no response for, well, for Illuvian? I think you, the, the experience is showing that normally you will get a response within the first few weeks that you implant it in the eye. It all depends on where you start. If we start with a pathology which is a minor problem, then you might see an impact earlier. If you see someone with an edema, which is a very prominent edema, it may take time for that to respond. And I have examples of patients that I injected one eye with Illuvian, the other eye with Ozordex, and the edema goes very quickly in the eye than the Ozordex, and it takes longer to go away with the Illuvian. So I, I wouldn't give up in the sense of com uh, uh, concluding that it's not working if, if after a month you see an, a small impact on the edema. That is important to see something. If you see nothing, it's worrying. But if you see a small reduction, just wait, because the likelihood is that we'll continue to improve. There is a big, can you yeah. say, there is a big for response about this one. Can you say, for example, after three months, because we have last time discussed this one, I think Dr. Saad was discussed as low as us in the last meeting, or I don't know, and they are saying that usually, uh, or Dr. I think Abdullah Bahtani, my dear friends, uh, they are talking about three to four months or up to six months. There will be a slow, but maybe you will start see the peak in the uh, yeah. uh, in six months. Is that for diabetes or inflammation? Yeah, yeah that's my question. <laughs> microedema, only diabetic microedema. Okay, for, because it depends on the nature of the edema, the response yeah. will be different. So in inflammatory cases, you're likely to experience a more rapid improvement. In diabetic edema, it may take longer to show a response. So, I agree. I agree. And I think Ahmad, Ahmad, yes, Ahmad. Uh, sorry, uh, Dr. Saad, you can go ahead. Uh, no, no, no. I was just, uh, I was just adding. I think there's also a difference in the amount released. I think Ozodex releases a little bit more, so that's why yeah. you see the response faster yeah, and sure. much more quicker. And yeah. I think that's something that you need to know you will probably see a quicker response with Ozodex, sure. but a delayed, more uh, sustained response with uh, everything. Yeah, yeah I just, you just, if I can have a comment on this, because uh, as I show you in one of the cases, sometimes the response is very fast, two weeks or four weeks, you have uh, five, but sometimes it's delayed. But my point is, don't rush to top up, because uh, the reason you switch to steroids, generally speaking, that you don't have uh, maximum response from the anti-VGF. So for, for, let's give an example. If you have a patient with 500 micron DME or uh, macular edema, and you keep injecting with anti-VGF and the maximum reduction in, in, C in C thickness was like 300 uh, AD, uh, thickness. So it's still edema there. So you decide to switch to uh, uh, steroid or Illuvian, whatever. 
And so uh, as long as the, uh, the edema does not go back to 500 or 600, it's playing around 300, 350. That means that this drug is still working. So give a chance for the drug as much as you can. For me, I'm not rushing to, to top up because the reason I'm, I'm switching to a steroid, I don't have a good response or enough response from the anti-VGF. So I should keep watching this patient as long as the edema does not increase. So I doing my target. My target is improve, is, is achieving yeah. now by maintaining the, the thickness on this level. And by time, for many cases, you can see that uh, the uh, this edema start to resolve, or it might increase because you know what during the 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 the, 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 the level of the control, the other comorbidities, not every patient is the same because we have a lot of comorbidity which can affect or delay the response. Also, the release. If you have dectomatized eye, uh, thick vitreous, something like that, it will affect the bio bioavailability of the drug and the releases of the drug. So there are many factors. So the, the message here, as long as you don't have worsening of the case, stay or, and wait and keep an eye on this patient because they might improve. Thank you, Ahmad. That's my, that's my point. This uh, clarification. Uh, I think we'll give this, uh, we see if we continue uh, waiting, then more questions coming. I want to finish. But, but so, Dr. Mohammed, I, I need answer to my question at the last of my presentation. I have a question for the panelist. Uh, okay, let me. <laughs> <My guess. laughs> I need to know your ex their experience. What uh, you know? Any OCT thickness measurement guidelines for using Ozordex or Illuvian and Illuvian? I don't think uh, so. What would I think you ask about the my biomarkers again, right? I yeah, it's it's any, no, any OCT thickness measurement guide. I mean, it's only about the thickness. I don't think, I mean, if we have 1000 or 700, then you have oh, to okay. uh, the thickness uh, only alone. Uh, is there any comment from? No, I don't. I don't think uh, the thickness should. Uh, I mean, we have some patients also. We have yeah, huge. I, I, I think the basic is that if you don't see a, a good response with the anti regif uh, we talk about anatomical response, which has been defined as uh, anything better than twenty percent. Then I think whatever the thickness is, you probably want to consider switching into steroid. So there's not necessarily a specific thickness that you look yes. for. Okay, can we have, uh, there is Dr. Muhammad Parnas, if he's still with us and he wants to, to, to ask or anything. And meanwhile, they open the mic for Dr. Muhammad. Um, I, I think the top up from, I have little experience with the Illuvian. And after, uh, sometimes if there is, uh, the patient is responding, then start deteriorating. Uh, and I feel if the deterioration very fast, going very fast, I try to uh, top up with steroid so I can have a fast response. Then the, the Olivian can continue to maintain for long and I have experienced some cases like this. Uh, while in case there is only a little bit change or you can say not that much a change in the, uh, in the OCT uh, thickness and the vision, maybe the most uh, a good parameter that the thickness is more, then I will uh, uh, select the uh, anti-VGF. Uh, I try like this and uh, it worked, but it's not a uh, general rules. And uh, this is my comment about that one. So Dr. Muhammad, is he is there? Muhammad Qanas, can you open the mic? If not, um, I think uh, we are already uh, uh, get to the end of this meeting. We are running behind the times more than 40 minutes, but it was a great discussion. It was a pleasure to have all of you, Dr. Carlos Pervizio. It's the first time we, 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 we saw you and we hope, we hope that we will meet again and again. Uh, we thank you for sharing your experience, uh, a very good and excellent experience in Illuvian, especially with uveitis. Uh, Dr. Carlos, I, I know you are a dear friend and we long, know, long time we know each other. Uh, thanks for the uh, very interesting cases. Dr. Ahmed Barqi, my dear friend, and also uh, Dr. Saad Wahid, uh, 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 real friends and my brothers. And we wish you to pray for us because you are in near to Mecca. Uh, we are very far now all this, pray for us. And uh, I want to uh, congratulate everyone uh, uh, everywhere in the world for Ramadan is coming, Ramadan Kareem for everyone. And we, our meeting in the future, it will be in Ramadan. So I want to announce that if in Ramadan, every Friday, we are going to have one posterior segment symposium. And on Saturday, we are going to have an anterior segment uh, symposium. 
there is a survey is running there. So we want the host and all, I mean, we want our attendees just to answer this question for to improve our uh, uh, meetings in future. Thanks all of you. If there is any uh, word or any comment from any one of you, I am ready to send this. Thanks, no, just thank, you. thank you all, all the my colleagues, uh, Carlos, uh, both Carlos. <laughs> it's a Carlos. pleasure to be here. Right yeah. <laughs> and I hope you stay safe. I hope the situation in UK and Spain become under control soon, inshallah, to, uh, very soon. And uh, all of the best for all of my friends, also my colleague, uh, Had, uh, Saad, Dr. Saad, and you, Muhammad, and all that it is. I wish you all the best and stay safe. And I hope to see you soon. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I want to say also to thank also, please, I don't want to forget to, to thank uh, uh, Alimera. Yeah, yeah, sure. For yeah, sorry. Yeah. And for their, their, their efforts to be with us during this uh, uh, situation of COVID and they are well supporting. And I would like also to thank uh, the, the, the company managing this one. They are done very well. I think I have the problem of the internet. That's why I failed to, to present my uh, presentation today. Uh, any comment, Dr. Saad, Dr. Carlos, anyone want to say something? Before well, thank we... you. Thank you. Just wanted to thank everybody. It was great. Uh, thank you. And again, everybody stay safe. Uh, hopefully we'll get over this. Uh, it seems that Europe has gone over the, uh, the uh, hump and uh, hopefully we will follow. And uh, we'll, um, everybody have a good summer. Thank you. Thank you. It's great. Thank you all. It was a pleasure sharing the session with all of you. A lot of interesting cases and uh... I've learned a great deal. So thank you all for that. Thank you. Good night or we leave now. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.